Hey guys. So this subject does not need a large intro, but what I'm going to be talking to you about today is about problems. So it's going to be a multiple part series, probably about five parts is kind of the goal. And I'm going to be talking specifically about various types of problems. And I'm definitely very motivated to kind of look into scripture around what God says about problems, but I'm also going to be using my own professional and education background in social work to um, perhaps give a little bit more understanding in that area. And hopefully that as we're looking at problems, we can look at understanding kind of the problems that we can resolve and work through and then the problems that are of our own doing and then also just looking at where there are certain problems that are not going to be addressed um, in this lifetime based on the fact that we are in a fallen world. So it's not to say we don't move towards solutions, but anyways, this is kind of the, the outline and the framework of how I'm going to do this series. And so without further ado, I'm just going to jump into kind of creating like a background and a context for you guys. So. Let's go into the first part. So as the scripture says, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. So this is from, for those of you who are not familiar with Proverbs, um, there's a lot of wisdom that is hidden in there, um, and it's definitely separated into different sections with like a particular focus in different areas. And so what we see kind of like in the beginning of Proverbs is just, there's kind of like this distinction that's made between like the way of folly, the way um, of going astray, and how wisdom is kind of the focus of of proverbs um, and this is the way that we are encouraged to live not like and this is obviously from this is from the old testament i want to say obviously but this is from the old testament so in terms of the context of using a proverb the the obviously it's for the jewish people at the time that it was being instructed but it's something that we can still apply within our christian faith and something that we can glean a lot from. And if you pay attention to the way the proverbs are kind of like set out and um, you can start to see not just that they're like just general, um, you know, theories about life, but they're also intended to be like very specific about certain areas of our life. And if we follow certain principles, we are more inclined. We're not more inclined. We are going to be more successful and experience the blessings of God over that. And so to create, I guess, a context of why I'm using this scripture, I'm going to use, I'm going to just first define the words wisdom um, as I'm going to be relating to it in this video. So there are obviously different ways we look at wisdom. One way which generally most of us are much more familiar with is like more of like a secular worldly wisdom that comes from human experience. Now, I'm not dismissing that. There is definitely wisdom that comes from human experience, but the way I'm going to be defining wisdom within this video is with the definition that wisdom is a capacity of the mind that allows us to understand life from God's perspective. That's a mouthful. I know it is. <laughs> I'm going to just, I'll put, I'll put it up for you just now, just so you can look at what I'm saying. I think this is the best synopsis I've seen about how to explain the wisdom that is written within the scriptures versus kind of the wisdom that is instructed in the world. So in the world, they'll tell you that there are certain things that come with like wisdom that come with age, right? So as you get older, you start to experience 
a certain type of understanding about life. And the thing I've kind of noticed about that, and I'm not saying that like people who are not Christian have zero understanding of life. But what I'm saying is that oftentimes their version of wisdom is heavily influenced by their own personal experiences. So like in terms of our, like their personal experiences, if they got injured or wounded in a particular area, which life in, inevitably does that to everybody, it skews their wisdom, it skews their perspective. So it might be something like, oh, well, you know, in our generation, you know, we worked very hard, we were very diligent, and, you know, people in this generation are just lazy, right? And so that might be sold as a secular form of wisdom, of worldly wisdom, of something that accumulated via age, being in a different generation. That's not the wisdom I'm talking about. It, it may not be false either to say that our generation has a different level of work ethic. I would not say that that's not true. But there are a lot of factors that influence that. So it's not just that people are lazy from younger generations. It's that there's also a shift in terms of technology. There's a shift in terms of jobs and, and vocations and, and people becoming more entrepreneur, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial <laughs> in uh, pursuit. So there are different variations as to this. Um, uh, you know, people are, are better able to have things accessible at their fingertips. So I don't think it would be singularly fair to say that the younger generation is just lazy. The world has also changed. And so we have to like take that into consideration when we look at each generation. So that would be kind of an example of how someone's personal experience may really skew or manipulate um, what is coming out of their mouth in terms of their version of wisdom. So I'm not referring to that. I'm referring to us being able to look at life from the perspective or to understand life from God's perspective and how he sees the best way for us to live our life. Um, in terms of understanding, so in all you're getting, get understanding. So I need to be able to comprehend it. So it's one thing for it to be presented to me, so information presented, or to be able to see principles, but in terms of like my level of individual comprehension, how do I now apply the wisdom? Now, why am I starting from a space of wisdom? Why am I starting from a place of talking about the Proverbs? Be proverbs, Proverbs, sorry, whatever, <laughs> whatever way you prefer to say it, I um, might be saying it wrong. But I'm starting here because in terms of dealing with problems, there is a requirement to have wisdom about how to evaluate them. So it's not that I will deal with all problems in one way. It's not that all problems are the same. It's not that all problems can be resolved like this. Some are, some aren't. And so I'm saying that wisdom is what has brought me to a place of trying to understand this. Um, and it has also brought me into a place of having different tools available to me that when I'm facing different problems and experiencing different problems, that when God has explained to me, like, this is what this type of problem is, or this is what this is, it is not with the intention to um, dismiss all the other factors about it, but it tailors my responsiveness to that problem. So um, also wanted to kind of clarify the word principle. So translated first in importance um, or considered chief, most important or considerable. So of all of the things that we can be doing, this is our focus. This is what needs to happen in order for us to have a life that is successful in God's eyes. And that's ultimately if you haven't gotten a sense of this channel, this channel is the intention is to be centralized around God. Like, so he needs to be at the very core of everything that I'm saying, because truthfully, 
he is the one who who really has the power to impact people's lives. It doesn't come just from the words that I construct and put together. So that is my desire is that we look at this, we look at problems from a biblical lens. And then also, again, I can share from my own um, education and professional background. Um, so I'm gonna conclude this section with saying, um, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So this was a scripture I referenced in the candid conversation I had, Proverbs 9 and 10. And so this is where we are going to be starting. So we understand now wisdom is the first thing that we need to under we need to have. We need to have understanding about the wisdom that we are seeing or viewing or experiencing. And then on top of that, the starting point is the fear of the Lord. So I'm going to move into the next section now. Okay, so the reason now I want to bring us back into Proverbs 9 and 10, talking about the fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom. So this is the starting point of addressing problems. This is like stage one. Is like, in order for me to address problems, I need wisdom. I need to be able to understand how to address things. And then the entry point into accessing wisdom is the fear of the Lord. So my question then as a starting point is like, where are you in that? Are you at a point in your own life where you can say that this is something that I'm doing my best to pursue and understand? Or are we dealing with God in a casual fashion? And to some degree, I do think that the churches now have done a disservice in terms of how they present the gospel and how they kind of create Jesus or or the gospel as like an addendum to your life of sin. It's like, oh, no, you can totally like come to God in a state of, of brokenness and stay there. And that's just not the point of the gospel. The gospel is not come into a relationship with God but never give him access to your life. Never understand the, the nature of the relationship between created being and creator. The intention really for us is, yes, we come in a broken state. We all come in a broken state. We, are, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Our righteousness is like rags before him. So it's not about what I do when I come into a relationship with him. It's about what he's done so I can come into a relationship with him and there is grace that covers that. It's through faith and my belief in him. However, if I'm living life in such a way where I'm not going to relinquish the things that the world has um, offered me and I'm continuing to pursue my own desires, my own work, I'm pursuing my own friends, I'm pursuing by the spouse that I want, I, my whole life is still about me. And then I'm saying like, yeah, like God's like, he's part of it because I go to church. That doesn't make you a Christian. That doesn't make you a Christian. Just being in a church doesn't make you a Christian. Going to church on Sundays doesn't make you a Christian. Even just saying the sinner's prayer does not necessarily make you a Christian. Is it genuine? Is it really something that comes from you opening up your heart and letting God in? And we have to take that kind of into consideration. It's like, God is not a God that we need to be casual around. He's not somebody that we don't treat with respect and reverence. No, we're to come to him with an understanding that like, yes, we are in relationship with him now because we are saved. But it doesn't mean that I come to him in, in a place of like disrespect or dishonor, or I come to him in a space where I'm like, oh, well, like you can totally be part of my life, but like leave most of it alone right? That is not, that is, that's not the design of this relationship with him. So if we lack understanding of the fear of the Lord, if we don't have a reverence or a fear of the Lord, how do we expect to really start to ingest the wisdom that comes from his words? We're not going to be able to really receive it in the same way. We need to come to a point of like where we, we are real willing to humble ourselves before him and saying, I don't know. The wisdom that I have used hasn't gotten me very far. Please teach me. Please guide me. 
And I want to learn how to live life according to your words. What does that look like? And I mean, that's the beauty of the Holy Spirit, right? Is that he prompts us. He convicts us. He lets us know like, no, don't do that. No, don't go in that direction. Don't say that. This is a time where you hold your tongue here. So we're starting to learn those types of um, responses. And that comes as an entry point from understanding the fear of the Lord and being able to lay things before him and humble ourselves before him. So now that I've kind of created that context, I know that was a, um, a mouthful. I'm going to talk about the first two um, types of problems. And I think both of them are probably ones that we are all very familiar with. So let's jump into the first one. Okay, so types of problems, number one, disobedience. <laughs> yes, this one hurts me too. So the two examples I'm going to use, Jonah and the prodigal son. I'm not going to go really deep into the scriptures. I will put it in the description box. But Jonah, well-known scripture, something that we are all very familiar with. He is told to go preach to, to Nineveh, doesn't want to, runs away to Tarshish, and then he gets swallowed by a fish in the midst of a storm. And so here's Jonah in the middle of a storm as a product of disobedience. His storm impacts various other people. Um, and so that would be kind of like an avoidable <laughs> type of problem. Uh, very, very likely there would have been no fish. There would have been no storm had he gone to where he was supposed to go. Second example, the prodigal son. So his problems in terms of when he spends all of his money and his resources on his lofty living, and now he's at a point where he's staring into what the pigs are eating, and he's thinking, well, this looks great, and then remembers his father's house, right? So he's at a point where he's at a lack of resources, a problem has occurred, and this is a product of his disobedience. He left his relationship with the father, and now he's in a place where there is no provision the way he's used to. So what I want to point to are in terms of like problems with disobedience is like they're they're extremely complex. So I'm not going to typecast problems about disobedience and say like, hey, like anytime you're disobedient, you're a horrible, terrible human being and you should be shamed and shunned. <laughs> I'm not saying that. Disobedience is something I think we all go through varying examples of disobedience. And sometimes our disobedience looks like we, we resist what God is prompting. Sometimes it's we're delaying what God is prompting and we're like kind of like not following through in what he's asked us to do. Um, sometimes disobedience can look like, you know, we hit kind of a, an obstacle or a problem in our life. And we feel like God has failed us, so we might go in a different direction because, you know, we might be angry with God. And that's that's what our disobedience looks like in that moment. So the intention is not to, like, throw shade about disobedience. I'm not encouraging it either. I'm not saying that, like, oh, I personally have had such great experiences when I've been disobedient. I've, I've, learned, I've had such wonderful times. Like, no. <laughs> I've paid heavily when I have been disobedient, heavily. I have found myself in situations where I'm like, oh, so if I had just listened, like, I, I, can, I can even think of just like little um, promptings, like things that I thought were not big issues. And I'm saying little, like not in terms of like God's promptings are little, but in terms of like they were not, huge signs they weren't like oh my god this this is a terrible way to go like i could just think even from like a standpoint of like wanting to do like an order of something in my day like being like you know what i should i'm gonna do this and then i'm gonna do this and i feel like this like tug in my spirit like no don't do that first do it after and i'm like 
What's the big deal? Like, I, this is, makes more sense. So in my brain, it makes more sense. And it causes a problem because I was disobedient in that moment. So even those like little promptings that we experience where we think like they're not a big deal, they actually might be, they're probably, they're often a direct for us to avoid a problem, avoid an issue that's coming. He sees ahead and we don't. And so when we are ignoring those like promptings that we think are just like little nudges, like give this to this person or do this right now or stop here, we just don't know why these things are happening. And it's honestly best to oblige. And so in terms of dealing with disobedience, disobedience has a pretty simple answer, which is if you are being intentionally disobedient, the best thing to do is to repent and reroute yourself back to where God has told you to go. If disobedience is a product of like you've been hurt or wounded in an area and you're reacting, then my suggestion would be to do your best to bring that to him so you can process where you've been injured and hurt and so he can help you like heal in that area. But also just like recognizing that <clears throat> disobedience is something that it is a teaching tool too, right? It's like, like there are natural consequences that comes from our disobedience and the grace that gets lifted off of those situations are very pronounced. So if you have ever been in that kind of situation and you see like, oh my God, everything's falling apart here and you knew you weren't really supposed to go in that direction, oftentimes that's a pretty good example of what it's like when we don't have grace in an area. So very simple remedy, do what he told you. <laughs> that's, that's probably the bottom line of all of that one. So I'm going to move into the second one now. Okay, so cycles or patterns. This is number two. There are biblical examples of this and... I'm not going to go into high level detail about biblical examples because you can easily look in, in scripture and see um, cycles that have occurred within particular generations or certain family lines. Those are not kind of like uncommonly referenced. People in the church culture might refer to them as like, um, like the curses uh, on God from God on specific people, like certain families and things like that. So you'll see things happen generationally. And there are different terminology that people use. Sometimes they'll say generational curses. Sometimes they say generational patterns. Um, but in terms of cycles or patterns, I want to kind of like frame it, I guess, more from like also a social work um We'll say like psychoeducation standpoint is that like we we are developed within a family unit you know for a good portion of our life and there is a lot of teaching that comes from that and this is where a lot of cycles or patterns generally originate and if there are cycles or patterns that develop after that oftentimes there's still like connection to some of the wounds that may have occurred within um, your family of origin. And we hear different terms around that. We hear things like, we hear about attachment issues, right? So we also hear about the term ACEs, right? And so that lets us know that people have specific vulnerabilities that have to do with trauma. So there are different things that connect to why people experience cycles or patterns. And, and in many cases, it can also be spiritual as well. So I don't want to dismiss that point. You may find that like, let's say, for example, you have a family that is constantly engaging in like idolatry, right? So like they have a false religion in the home. It's probably not going to be surprising that that's something that they're, the children may try to also engage with. Doesn't mean God can't correct that. Like I came from a family that, that was, um, that primarily practice Islam and that's a false religion. And here I am <laughs> like free from that. Right. So I don't want to say like, Oh, like you, God can't break you out of those things. But I see this happening within my family. I see 
multiple people within my family continuing to perpetuate a false religion, right? Because that is where it originated, it originated in the place of, of their um, their childhood. This is what they learned. This is what they grew up around. And so it's very easy for them to continue that pattern or that cycle. And in terms of like addressing problems or addressing um, the problems that come from these cycles or patterns, those are ultimately going to have to come through the wisdom that God gives. So people call it differently. They might say like there's like revelatory information that comes from that. And that is what will help you see kind of a cycle that you are caught in. So I can think of like, for example, like I've mentioned my addiction to smoking through many videos. And so that is something that I could easily say was happening within a cycle within my family right so it wasn't just me that was smoking there was my dad was also smoking. i watched my dad growing up smoking right i also saw various other family members um primarily men that were smoking around me my sister started smoking when she was pretty young i so i'm i'm seeing this and it's something that i'm constantly familiar with around so it was not difficult for me at a certain point to eventually pick it up now we all have probably different motivations in terms of what creates our own cycles i can say that what was tied to this cycle for me was like needing to communicate so it was like i i need to talk about something there's a problem or there's an issue and i didn't grow up in a home where we did that and so what happens when you don't have the ability to resolve problems, you don't have the ability to work through issues, is you keep it inside of you, right? And that's all that, there's nowhere else for it to go. It's not going to be resolved. So it's just going to stay inside of you. So the next best thing is going to be coping with how it feels. So that maintains a cycle or pattern. So the behavior might look the same. So you might have anger in your household, but people might be reacting to anger in different ways for different reasons. But the at the core of it, it's the same kind of cycle or pattern that they're engaging in. So the revelatory information, the wisdom that God gives, it gives us the ability to be able to break those cycles and break those patterns, you know? And I can say again, like back to the example I used the first time um, that was prompted to me by the Holy Spirit. Like every time you feel the need to smoke, what you actually need to do is you need to talk and tell me how you feel. And this started to break down the cycle I was experiencing. So uh, just to be clear, I did not stop smoking um, because I used a smoking aid or because I was personally competent or able to do it. It was, he was dealing with my heart around letting go of what was going on, what was keeping me stuck in that cycle or pattern. And the more I started to talk and express how I felt, the more all of those feelings that I was coping with weren't really there anymore. So the only reason I'm smoking is because it's a habit now and because a part of me still thought like, you know, I kind of enjoy it. But like the more the function went away, the more the reason went away, eventually it just became progressively easier to not do it. So um, in terms of, again, like the, the remedy to that, wisdom, God giving revelatory information, and that requires sometimes a specific prayer. Um, so it might be like, God, help me see what this is. God, help me understand what is going on in this area. Help me to, to just like to better understand why is it I can't let go of this. And that is where he will be able to come in. So I'm going to stop here and um, let me... Let me know what you guys think, if this is something that you guys are interested in, and whether you want to keep going around this. Um, I do still have six more problems <laughs> that I'm going to be discussing. So like I said, that'll probably be in, um, I would say, yeah, four or five, probably four videos. So anyways, I hope you guys have a great day and um, let me know um, what you guys think and we'll talk soon. Okay, bye.